Still on mute. I just did it. These are the words that still echo in my mind. You see, I, I just finished reading a novel, Rosemary's Baby, and that was filled with a battle between good and evil, priests and demons, Christ and the devil, and exorcism. A horribly scary book of supernatural power and supernatural beings. Really, it was just awful. It's, it's, it's sensational. It was awful fiction for me since... Faith in the Bible and God had been drained from my heart through science, so-called, Darwin's evolution, and my own sinful lifestyle. But that didn't stop me from my new endeavor, reading the Bible. The last time I picked it up was to verify the astrology signs in the book of Revelation. And this time, it was the account of the multiplication of the fishes and the loaves. Well, our up north high criticism theology seminary trained Methodist preacher had told us, had explained the miracle away, and, and he did it by saying everybody really had food with them in their robes. And, but there were so many people that they were, uh, but that everyone except one little boy was afraid to share. So the miracle that, was, that came that day was that everybody shared their lunch. What a miracle. Still, as an unbeliever but skilled in literature, I was reading the passage in Matthew, and I was going to find the place in the text where the disciples actually had time to go out and go buy some food for this multitude. Alone in my room, I was reading in my bed, hoping to fall asleep which had become impossible lately. I was on an upside down cycle where I worked or partied most of the evening and slept most of the day. But on my third skeptical reading through the passage, I heard a voice in my head, as real as a voice in the room, saying, I did it, I just did it. Well, Jesus, if you're real, came out of my sneering smile. Put me to sleep. I felt a hand touch me on my shoulder, and I turned my head to the side, and I fell asleep. When I woke up in the morning, I stood up and saw the sun shining through the window, and the thought registered that it was morning, not afternoon. And I realized that a supernatural miracle had granted me rest. And I looked at my bed and I said, I'm going to live for Jesus from now on. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, without your help we can do nothing. But with your help we can do all things. So we plead for your help right now. We ask that your Holy Spirit, which has been here with us, would grant us the peace that passes all understanding, and that you would grant us truly gifts of repentance, that your word would be alive and living thing in our heart. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the question for our sermon today is, who is this man? And I was reading in Mark 6, verse uh, 51 through 52, in the New Living Translation, and it said, Then he climbed into the boat, and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed, for they didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. 
Their hearts were too hard to take it in. I thought about this. We could have called this a day in the life of, uh, of the Savior. Because already he, he's linking two miracles that I had never linked together before. The one that Ricky read to us about, about the, them being on the boat and the waves coming up. Jesus waking up and saying, peace be still. But then he asks them, where's your faith? Why were you afraid? I always thought that was a little bit abrupt. You know, where's your faith? Why are you? I'm afraid because I think we're going to sink. We're going to drown. The waves are coming over and you're bailing and it's not helping you. I, I understand why I'm afraid if you've ever been in a storm on the sea. Then he says, but where's your faith? Now in this passage, it says they were totally amazed and it gives the reason. It says, for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves, which was the multiplication of those loaves and fishes. And their hearts were too hard to take it in. Well, with your permission, and probably even without your permission, I'm going to um, have us listen to eight minutes of these two miracles. And there's a wonderful reading of it. It's from John, the sixth chapter. And what I'm going to do is play it on the phone, and then I'm going to let you look at the screen and so the words will go by. But it's eight minutes long, but I think it's beautiful. Linking these two miracles together, God's going to do it for us. John 6, and this is from the New Living Translation. Chapter 6, Jesus feeds 5,000. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked him, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that, this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled twelve baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they just keep going, please. <laughs> well, that's not the way it played out on Thursday. Let's try it again. Donald, do you have mic, please? Surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Jesus walks on water. That evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still had to come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. Soon a gale swept down upon them, and the sea grew very rough. They had rowed three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. They were terrified, but he called out to them, Don't be afraid, I am here. Then they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. Jesus, the bread of life. The next day the crowd that had stayed on the far shore saw that the disciples had taken the only boat, and they realized Jesus had not gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. 
They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you. Not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. Then the people began to murmur in disagreement, because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? But Jesus replied, Stop complaining about what I said. For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day, I will raise them up. As it is written in the scriptures, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I, who was sent from God, have seen him. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever, and this bread which I will offer so the world may live is my flesh. Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many disciples desert Jesus. Many of his disciples said, This is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. So he said to them, Does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe me. Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. Then he said, That is why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, Are you also going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of give eternal life. We believe. No, you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus said, I chose the twelve of you, 
but one is the devil. He was speaking of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, one of the twelve, who would later betray him. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. Other manuscripts said, read, you are the Christ, the Holy One of God. You are the Christ, the Son of God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus, the true bread that came down from heaven. A question again, who is this man? I'm sorry, it goes sometimes like past where I wanted to go. The question, the answer is, in 1 Timothy, 2nd chapter, verses 5 through 6, it says there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. The man Christ Jesus. He gives his life to purchase freedom for everyone. And this is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. Right now we have a present message that some people have blown over. They don't realize that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, the seed of the woman. He was as much human as Mary. Mary was as much human as her mother, and this humanity is the same humanity that you and I have. So Jesus was very, very man, if you will. And that's why there's one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. So understanding that Jesus is a man was not a problem for the disciples. They got it. They said, who is this man? But what they didn't get is something we're going to start studying right now. In the prologue to um, in the prologue to John, uh, the first chapter, in the first verse, it says, in the beginning the word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He came into the world, He created, but the world didn't recognize Him. He came to His own people, the Jews, and even they rejected Him. So the Word became, what? Human. And made His home among us. And He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father, Father's one and only Son. Now when you think about that, remember that there was a, 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 a time when Jesus was transfigured. He had Peter, James, and John with him. And those three got to see Jesus with light. His clothes became so bright that, that it even says like if you had, they said fuller, but it's like bleach. You couldn't bleach things this white. They were full of glory. They saw this light come off of Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration. And John says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. They've seen it with their eyes. Where it says he became human, the Greek says he became flesh. Where it says uh, unfailing love and faithfulness, the Greek says, of, or grace and truth. He was full of grace and truth. That's the way we usually hear it. In Hebrews, this um, is Paul, most likely Paul's the author of Hebrews. He's rewriting this, and he's telling us about Jesus also. Because in the past, God spoke to our ancestors many times and in many ways through the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us through who? His son. He, his son, is the one through whom God created the universe. So here's me in my bedroom thinking, um, you know, how do you pull this miracle off, God? How, how do you uh, make these fishes and these loaves feed 5,000 people? I don't, I don't think so. But the truth is, he, the Bible says, is the one through whom God created the universe the one whom God has chosen to possess all things at the end, because after Christ comes back, he, 
he is the, the king of the universe that we can see, and we're going to look at that. Jesus, the sun, reflects the brightness of God's glory, and he's the exact likeness of God's own being. I like this in the um, King James Version. This is the version I've memorized, and I think you should have some of these verses in your quiver, in your, you know, in your toolbox. Christ, who being the brightness of his glory, and look at this one, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. This is Christ. This is the Son. This is Jesus that walked among us. Sustaining the universe with his powerful word. Have you thought about that? Have you ever thought about the reason why God can't lie? Amen. God can't lie because when he said, let there be light, there was, there was light. Amen. If he says, be healed, you're healed. If he says, let, you know, let him see, the person's eyes were created and they could see because his word is powerful. Yeah. After achieving forgiveness for the sins of all human beings, do you realize there's not a person that you meet on the street who Jesus not only died for but redeemed? Because Jesus took every human being that ever lived or ever will live. He took their DNA and he took it to the cross. Yeah. And he redeemed all human beings. It's not your. It's not like you have to say, please, please, Jesus, please redeem me. Jesus went to the cross for every human being that ever lived and ever will live, Amen. and he has redeemed them. If you say no, I don't believe it. No, I don't want any part of it. No, I'm, I'm just not into it. That's the part that turns that gift down. But God has already granted the gift to all human beings in the death of His Son, Jesus, in the life that He lived, and in the resurrection that He had, showing that He is alive. And that's what it says here. After achieving forgiveness for the sins of all human beings, He sat down in heaven at the right side of God, the supreme power being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Hebrews 1, 4. I love this in Colossians. Somebody brought this to me in my very early part of my walk, and I was like, what? This makes it so much sense. Now I get it. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created, and He is supreme over all creation. Colossians and the Good News Bible says it this way, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn Son, superior to all created things. All created things. And that position of firstborn Son is that position of being in charge, you know, if, you have, if you're the oldest kid in the family, you usually have more responsibilities, especially when the little ones come up. I knew a family when I was at, uh, I went to Oral Roberts University, and there was a gal that sat across from me, and we would talk at lunchtime and supper time, and she said, I'm one of ten kids. Whoa, I said, that's a beautiful family. And she said, yep. And when mom brought home number five, number five came to me. I was the, she was the oldest. And when she brought home number six, number six went to the second born and said, you're, you're in charge of this one, and so on. Number seven went to number three, and number eight went to number four, and number nine went to number, did I miss a number? Anyway, f five. <laughs> Everybody had a kid to take care of. Why do we mention that? Because... It is so beautiful to think that that God gives a position to the firstborn. There's a responsibility, you're the oldest one. And so the concept in the word firstborn is used to talk about Jesus as being the, the superior being of all the universe. Amen. We're going to get to some other profound thoughts here in a minute. We hope. Oh, I forgot something. 
this is a good time. I have to ask Ricky if you'll come and get this. And uh, who else can I ask? You can handle it? Everybody needs one of these. And Donald, if you'll do this side. This is your handout. And this is in case nothing, in case something has stopped working. See, this is red, Ernie. So you might just flip them in the back for me. Take a look at your handout for a second, please. It has these scriptures that I hope that you're going to take a look at later when you get a chance. That part that we were um, that part that we were looking at on the screen is written in really teeny tiny letters on the back. Okay. But these are the verses that we've been looking at so far. And when we talk about this part in Colossians, that Christ is a visible image, likeness of the invisible God. He's the firstborn son superior to all created beings. Now, some might say uh, that because he's a son, that he's not equal to God. But the Bible also says, I and my father are one. And we're going to look at some other beautiful parts to that. Colossians 2 and verse 9. The battery is running low. Colossians and verse 9. What I really need is just for you to do the down, um, down on the computer. That would be the best thing I could have. Unless your computer dies. That's true. That would be good. Either. So we stop and have a prayer for me. <laughs> Let's just have a prayer yeah. one more time. Father in heaven, we, we know that you have a, a powerful message in your word today. And I ask that the little technical things that are not working out so good would, would still not take away from the power of your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So at the bottom of that page that you just uh, received, it says Colossians 2 and verse 9. It says, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, what? Say that word? Bodily. Well, that doesn't make as much sense to us as the next one, does it? It says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in what? A human body. Can you take that in? Can you even understand what that just said? For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? How did God fit all of the Godhead into that? And we could go back to the womb of Mary. We can go back to little Jesus as a toddler, growing up in um, in uh, wisdom and, and truth. You know, Jesus growing up, but all the fullness of will uh, go down a couple more, please. To Colossians two. There we go. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Can you wrap your mind around that? I can't. But that's what God did. Now I'm going to quick tell you a story that you hear at Christmas time mostly. And that story is about a man that, that he was not the one that went to church. He was the one that stayed home when his kids and the wife went to church. And the wife prayed for him, and the kids prayed for him. They wanted him to have the joy that they had of knowing Jesus as their Savior. And he was there, and in the story, it's Christmas Eve, and there are, strangely, there are birds that are flying out on Christmas Eve. I don't know, maybe it's Tennessee, who knows where it is, maybe it's Florida. But there's snow comes, there's snow comes. And these birds, because he's got the lights on in the living room, they keep flying against the window, banging against the window. And he's like, 
I can't take this, you know, I mean, I gotta go out there. And he goes out there and he shoes them away. He's trying to get them to leave and they, and they won't they won't go away. So he says, I know what I'll do. I'll go turn the lights off in the living room. I'll turn the lights on in the, in the barn. And then those birds, maybe they'll just, you know, it's after sunset, it's dark. Maybe they'll go in there and, you know, nest in there and they'll stop flying against my window. And he goes to the barn, he turns on the lights and he's, you know, he's basically saying, come on birds, here birdie, here birdie. And the birds,